Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Inside the Breakthrough, a new history of science podcast full of did you know stuff. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Welcome to a classic episode of the show. I am always so happy to have you along. We aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. I am your host, Stacey Sims. And this time around, I'm revisiting my first interview with Sugar Surfing's Dr. Stephen Ponder. Dr. Ponder has lived with type 1 for more than 50 years. He is a pediatric endocrinologist and a certified diabetes educator. Sugar surfing is about real-time management of diabetes. Dr. Ponder coined the term in 2013, but it was a long time coming. A lot of research, a lot of work. It's hard to believe now with continuous glucose monitors and closed-loop systems, but the thinking that you're going to hear Dr. Ponder talk about was pretty revolutionary in the early and mid-2000s. This interview comes less than a year after he published his book, Sugar Surfing. And by the way, that is still free for newly diagnosed people, um, newly diagnosed families. And I will link up more information about how you can get that in the show notes over at diabetes-connections.com. So what is Dr. Ponder up to these days? Well, he has become a frequent and welcome guest on this show. I last spoke to him for our New Year's Day episode when healthcare providers were getting the COVID vaccine. That was such a joyful show. I loved being able to talk to them. some of the first people in the country to get the COVID vaccines, and he was one of them. Dr. Ponder is the medical director at Texas Lions Diabetes Camp, where he has volunteered for almost 40 years. And in 2018, he was named the National Diabetes Educator of the Year. He also founded a free medical clinic for children, all children, not just those with diabetes. Our original sugar surfing interview in just a moment. But first, this episode of Diabetes Connections is supported by Inside the Breakthrough, surprising stories from the history of science. Dan Riskin digs deep and entertains as he connects those old stories to what modern day medical researchers are facing. As you know, 2021 is the 100 year anniversary of the discovery of insulin. That is arguably the biggest scientific discovery in Canadian history. This series examines that moment and many others through the lens of Canadian researchers trying to find what's next for the fight against diabetes. I love this podcast. I have listened to every episode. I highly recommend it. Search for Inside the Breakthrough anywhere you find podcasts. And a good time to remind you, this podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Dr. Ponder, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me today. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's, I'm excited to talk to you. But, but before we talk about sugar surfing and some of the listener questions, 50 years with type 1 diabetes this month. H how are you doing? And do you remember your diagnosis? Oh, very much so. I was nine years old when I went into the hospital, and I was having fairly mild symptoms, uh, increased urination, uh, you know, weight loss, and so on. Parents were puzzled by that, took me to my pediatrician, and uh, I don't remember all the details. I do remember getting poked a few times, and uh, lo and behold, uh, later that day, uh, my mom was, get, was called by my pediatrician, and I was admitted to a local uh, hospital in, in an old-fashioned ward, of all things, with four beds. Uh, they, were, they were not separate rooms at that point in time. And um, I was managed for about nine to ten days in the hospital. Um, interestingly, by today's standards, I never saw a pediatric endocrinologist. Of course, there were not many of them in existence in the in the 1960s uh, outside of large, you know, academic uh, institutions. But um, I was managed by a pediatrician my entire childhood. You were managed by a pediatrician. That's fascinating. What was the treatment? What was the management like? Well, uh, not unlike a lot of people today, you know, where you'll hear stories where uh, the doctor or the nurse handed them an, an, uh, a lemon or an orange to practice injections on, I really fell into that classic model where the, I was given uh, a piece of fruit to inject my insulin into for practice. Uh, we did have plastic needles back then, but uh, the reality was I was sent home with glass syringes and reusable uh, needles, which were about 26, 25 to 26 gauge, which by today standards were huge in terms of both length and, and, and width. Um, and I took one shot a day of a what, what doesn't exist anymore, an insulin called Lente, L-E-N-T-E. -E. Uh, the closest thing that comes to it is, uh, is NPH insulin, the cloudy NPH. And even many of your listeners won't even know what that is anymore uh, in this day and age. But I was uh, treated with Lente insulin for, gosh, about uh, 
15 years until I started medical school in 1980 and uh, met my first endocrinologist who put me on the path to uh, multi-dose insulin therapy and very quickly after that, insulin pumps. Wow. That's amazing how much the, the practice must have changed. What led you to become a pediatric endocrinologist? Well, I think that uh, diabetes camp, when I uh, went to camp in 1981, uh, it was kind of interesting. Uh, the the uh, person who ultimately would become my mentor was doing a research study uh, for one of the insulin companies uh, that were just rolling out uh, biosynthetic human insulin. Uh, up until then, we were using animal insulins. Uh, and uh, during that study, his research nurse asked me this innocent question about diabetes camp. And she said, oh, by the way, uh, Steve, we, we have this camp for kids with diabetes. And I had actually gone to camp, not the same one, but I'd gone to a camp uh, a couple of years after I was diagnosed. So I said, sure, wh why not? And, and I said it with about that much commitment. <laughs> and uh, after I went to the camp uh, in 1981, uh, I just you know, found my calling. I, I went back every year and I have been going back every year since, and, and about 25 years ago, I actually became the medical director of the Children's Diabetes Camp in Texas, at the Texas Lions Camp, um, and that pretty much sealed my fate in regards to becoming uh, uh, a, pedi a pediatric endocrinologist. Uh, uh, the friendships I made and the uh, people I was able to, um, in some ways, I, I suppose, influence, uh, and it's been something I'll continue to do until I can't do it anymore, and uh, I go back every year. I've spent uh, <clears throat> several years of my life uh, in the town where this camp is located. In fact, um, we recently, uh, about 10 years ago, that is recently, purchased a home not too far from there, which uh, I may well retire to at some point in the future. You know, this is the time of year when a lot of families have already signed up for summer camp, for diabetes camp, but there may still be people on the bubble trying to figure out, is this the year we do it? What would you say to them? Why is it good for kids? And And what about the reluctance of, gosh, you know, are they going to be homesick? Are they going to be taking well, you know, cared for as well as I can do at home? Well, I think it depends on the camp. The camp that I work at uh, serves children with special needs during the rest of the summer. And so they're very accustomed to taking children whose parents are, have been generally reluctant to let them out of the home. And these are children that have visual problems, uh, hearing problems, physical disabilities, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome. And so they are extremely capable and competent in getting uh, the, the young boys and girls involved very quickly. In fact, as soon as the children are dropped off, they're whisked away to be, uh, you know, to a playground, to be active, to get settled into their, their bunks and so on. Um, they have really taken it to a fine art to the ability to keep kids from being homesick. Now, we take kids that are age 8 to 15 at this camp, and, um, and, and yes, there's always a little bit of that at the beginning uh, for some of the 8-year-olds. Not always, but, uh, but some of them uh, may struggle a little bit, but they are generally within a day or so uh, just right in the swing of things, if not just in a matter of hours uh, into the swing of things. So I think we've, we've not had to worry so much about that. Now, my medical staff... We take about 75 people on the medical staff, and we have 220 campers uh, uh, in two separate sessions, so 440 total. And we have uh, a very high level of competency in that group, too. Many of them are former campers. They're medical professionals, nurses, doctors, uh, you know, endocrinologists, uh, and, and volunteers. So we, I think we've done a pretty good job over the last uh, 35 years refining the method uh, to keep kids uh, engaged, happy, and active to the point that when they go home a week later, there many of them are, are would like to stay a little bit, a few days longer. <laughs> I think diabetes camp is fantastic. My son is going to have his fourth year, fifth year. He'll be he'll be a fifth year camper this year, and it's been amazing. The friendship he he makes, the uh, the kids he stays in contact with, and the empowerment. This camp is where he did his first inset. It's where he moved his Dexcom to a different location. It's 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 just so great for those kids to kind of figure out who they are, I think, too, away from their parents. I'm a huge supporter of summer camp. I think that's great. It's a wonderful experience all the way around, and, and, and it forges some great friendships, as you've already mentioned, uh, that can continue well after camp, especially, I suppose, in this day of social me era of social media. Uh, the, the campers can stay in touch, you know, oh, between Don't get me started well. on the group texting that goes on. My kids go to a different, a longer summer camp later in the summer, too, and the group texts that are going, it's crazy. But let's talk, <laughs> let's talk about sugar surfing. Um, you have really hit a nerve, I think, in a great way with so much of the diabetes community. Sugar surfing, and I'll ask you to better explain it, but it seems to me is about 
learning how your body reacts and really staying on top of your diabetes um, more so so that you're, I guess, less reacting less to what's going on, trying to predict more. And instead of making big changes all day long, trying to kind of nudge your blood sugar here and there. Am I am I even close? Oh, you're absolutely right. Uh, that's exactly what it's about. It's management in the moment, as I say in the book. Uh, um, once you look at blood sugars in a dynamic fashion as something that's constantly shifting and changing, uh, you, you come to the same conclusion that you have to make um, uh, anticipatory judgments as well as reactive judgments. And in a perfect world, um, half of your control is what you plan. The other half is what you have to react to or what you have to do uh, based on unexpected occurrences. And that's just life in general. So I think you can take a lot of the things you know about life in general and apply them to diabetes. You just have to be comfortable or develop a sense of comfort with the various forces that you have at your disposal that can move your blood sugars around, whether it's insulin, activity, uh, the foods you eat, the types of foods, the amounts you eat, when you eat them. And, and when you boil it down, uh, diabetes care is nothing more than a series of informed choices. Uh, at the beginning, those choices are in some ways made for you, or at least you're instructed to make these choices a certain way. But many people find that very limiting, and they want to break free of that, and many of them have, and have done that well before I wrote this book. And whether they call it sugar surfing or have some other term for it, uh, they're making more management decisions in the moment, which really improves their control and helps them better steer their, their glycemic trend lines uh, in a more normal fashion. Well, and let's, if we could, get kind of specific, if you don't mind. Uh, I, I'm curious, like, how would you tell someone, here's how we're going to use sugar surfing to make your morning and your breakfast a little bit more smooth? Would you mind maybe taking us through that? Like, you wake up at a certain blood sugar and you're going to eat something for breakfast and how you might handle that? Well, a lot of the principles behind sugar surfing are things that have been taught for many years. Uh, they are, include, you know, waiting a sufficient time after you take your insulin uh, to better time it uh, or get it in synchrony uh, with the food you're about to eat. Also, understanding the, the glycemic or the, the fingerprint, if you will, of the meal or the food you're about to eat as well. So you have to match those two things up. You know, I use metaphors a lot, and I will say this to the young children, that, you know, a, a football quarterback that's sort a football to a wide receiver is actually throwing the ball to a spot that there's no person at at that particular point it's it's released and you're trying to do the same thing with the, between timing food and insulin if if food is the ball and the wide receiver is the insulin uh, the, you know the, the the quarterback that is the patient needs to lead uh, uh, you know lead the, the insulin needs to be led a little bit before you throw the food at it and in a practical way with sugar surfing uh, when you're looking at the trend line on your continuous glucose monitoring device you will often want to wait for a bend or an inflection point downward uh, that generally occurs anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 minutes, maybe longer, maybe shorter, uh, after that insulin dose is given, uh, such that the downward force that insulin is being seen uh, on the glucose trend line, then the, when the food is consumed, then it's more likely to be matched up or synchronized with the rising force, if you will, of the sugar that comes from that particular meal, assuming there is a lot of carbohydrates. And you have to then adjust that insulin dose according to what you understand about those that, that particular food. And to be more specific for breakfast, I, I promote the, the concept of the top 10 list. And this is not David Letterman per se, <laughs> but they're, they're, everyone has a top 10 favorite everything. You have a top 10 favorite breakfast, the top 10 favorite uh, lunch and dinner. Uh, and that could easily be determined over the span of several weeks. You could actually count, well, how much, how many times they, does this person eat this, that, or the other thing? Anyway, uh, focus on your top 10 list. So if you, if you enjoy a certain type of cereal or oatmeal or toast or, uh, pancake or whatever you have for breakfast, uh, then determine over time, and this is through observation, determine what effects those those particular meals have in general on your blood sugar, how soon they respond, how, how aggressive they tend to be. And then you design an insulin regimen that best matches those. And you use your trend line on your sensor to give you the best uh, idea of how well you're matching those two things up to the point that you minimize the rise in the blood sugar. You want to prevent the spike uh, that occurs after, the, after you eat. What most people make the mistake of doing, and they've been taught this, and it's not always their, their, their fault, it's, they've been told this, 
is to take their insulin at or after they eat. Now, while that works fine for a child or toddler who you don't know will finish their meal, if it's an older child or an adult who can easily, you know, complete the whatever they they had uh, food put in front of them, then they should be timing uh, their insulin with their food better with the goal to be to minimize the rise that occurs afterwards. Now, that's where the A1C elevations come from in most people that are down in the 6, 7, and 8% range is what happens to their blood sugar after they eat, not so much what they are before they eat. And I'll use this example a lot with people. If I was teaching somebody how to hit a golf ball and I, and I gave them the proper stance and positioning and so on, uh, the right clubs and all that, and I let them strike the ball a hundred times, yet I never let them see where the ball landed, <laughs> I'm not sure I'd make them a very good golfer. And, and that's, in a sense, what you're doing. You need to see where all that effort uh, re- leaves you. And if you're not checking a blood sugar in the next two to three hours after a meal, which a lot of people don't or they've never been told to do, then you're setting people up in some ways to fail because the assumption is that the doctor has given you some sort of ratio or some sort of formula um, and they told you to measure a certain amount of food and if you only do those two things correctly you'll basically hit a hole in one every time and I think anybody who's done this for any period of time knows that that's just not true and you need to have a different way of looking at this in fact you may have to steer it even as it's moving and that's a more an advanced sugar surfing method is is trying to steer the direction uh, of your of your trend line after you've already taken your insulin and after you've already taken your food. But uh, I'll tell you, I do it all the time. You know, yeah, well, I tell us about that a little bit because that, as you say, and I'll put this back in here, it's a little bit more advanced. You want to be careful with this stuff. But how, how do you do that? Oh, well, you know, it's observation, it, it, constant observation. I, I glance at my sensor uh, track uh, anywhere between 40 and 50 times a day. Uh, it's not unlike you glancing at the dashboard of your car when you're driving home or looking in the rearview mirror. You're, you're constantly scanning your surroundings as you're moving forward, and you have to take that same principle with you uh, when you sugar surf. I mean, if you're surfing, you have to be well aware of your, of your surroundings. So uh, you just can't act three or four times a day uh, when you take an insulin dose and, or eat food and expect to have the tightest control possible. You have to decide how willing are you or how able are you to be more aware of what's going on in the moment. And as you see something trending up or trending down, keep us keep more of an eye on it and decide, do I need to step in and alter the direction of my, of my trend line? I mean, as we're talking right now, I'm looking at my sensor and I'm straight line at 96. Uh, on my particular sensor, I've been str- I've been in my zone between uh, uh, 70 and 140 uh, for the last several hours. I'm, I'm pretty much a straight trend line. But yes. when I start to slowly drift down or slowly drift up, I pay a little bit more attention to that, and I want to see if it, is it is it approaching a threshold that I've decided in advance that I'm going to act upon. And I change those thresholds all the time based on the circumstances. If I'm outside doing lots of intense work, I, I may want to run a little bit higher, and I'll tolerate a blood sugar of 160, 170, 180, just so I'll have a bit of a buffer underneath me if I'm if I'm you know doing a lot of yard work or, or doing a lot of exercise. Yet when I'm in the office like I am now, I I like being around 100 uh, between 80 and, and 120, and I just steer the line in that fashion, and I do it through frequent glances and a lot of, a lot of times it's just looking at the sensor plot and that's it I do nothing else I just stopped looking at it a couple a few seconds ago um, and but if I saw something trending down uh, I'm going to preempt or, or act in advance of, of developing a low uh, I'll do the same thing in advance of what I think will become a high now do I sometimes over treat or prevent or do too much yes I've done that in the past that's when I was just beginning this but I've learned to use much smaller quantities uh, of both insulin and carbohydrates to steer this line. I don't have to take 15 grams to treat a low. Right. I can prevent a low with 4 grams, and, and I use things that are easily available, uh, sips of juice, uh, glucose tablets that have 4 grams of carbohydrates. So I've used these units of, of, of currency, if you will, and I've learned how to use these to make small steering moves in the direction of the line of blood sugar. And that's really what sugar surfing is all about, is steering that line, which everyone has, and nobody has a straight line blood sugar. Everybody, Everybody's blood sugar line moves with or without diabetes. And uh, I say this in the book, I say it in my workshops, the only person with a straight line blood sugar is a dead person. Yeah, it's always on the move. <laughs> and you just have to learn how to steer it. And uh, uh, the continuous glucose monitoring technology is a paradigm shift in, in diabetes management. 
Let's talk about the CGM. I have to tell you, in the last, we've used it for a little bit more than two years, and it really has changed our management, just like what you're going to talk about here, in that when you see it going up, you can take a little bit of action, or when you see it going down. Do you need a CGM of some kind to sugar surf? And, you know, is that something that really has changed your way of even looking at management? Uh, when I first came into sugar surfing through the concept of what I call frequent pattern management, um, we did a research project a few years ago. We published in 2012 in Diabetes Care. This is a randomized controlled trial where we developed a technology which would share information every night uh, with families uh, electronically. They, their blood glucose meter was a wireless uh, I had a wireless modem in it. It would upload to the cloud, and, and every night it would send all the information back in, in a very colorful format for families to look at. Well, we did a year-long study where we wanted to see what the impact of that, that frequent uh, feedback would have on, uh, on, on behaviors, and we found that we saw improved control uh, with patients who got that regular feedback rather than taking the time and effort themselves to go download or print something out or write things down in a logbook and such. Uh, and we used a control group where they, everyone else just did that. They just, they would do that whenever they felt like it. Uh, but that frequent follow up, that frequent exposure to the data improved control by a full percentage point. If their A1Cs were over 8% at the beginning of the study, after a year it had dropped, uh, and stayed, uh, stayed down about 1%. If it was uh, seven and a half uh, or below, I'm sorry, if it was below eight, that is, uh, they improved by about a half a percent. And this was with zero physician interaction. This is just getting the information back in their hands. So this is a very, very preliminary version of what you could call CGM, which is, and that's really hyper-frequent you know, pattern management because you're glancing down at that sensor. Now, that depends on the human being that's using that data. You know, yes, it's recording every several minutes. It's giving you a data point, but somebody still has to look at it and somebody still has to make decisions about what to do with that information. And it made me just like Kenny Rogers, you know, you know, walk away, run, hold them, fold them, that sort of thing. That's what you're doing with, with this information. You are making decisions in the moment. The fact of the matter is they see that, that people are making decisions all day long with their diabetes. This is in the book. There was a study a few years ago that showed the average person without diabetes makes 221 choices a day about food. And so, and that's just about food, much less whether you have diabetes and you're worried about food. So choices are the currency of control. And, and, and as you're making these choices, uh, you're not always going to make the best choice. You're not always going to make the right choice. But you hopefully are somebody that's wise enough to learn from those choices and make better choices the next time. So it's a constant uh, series of self-improvement steps that you're doing with sugar surfing. It's not that the doctor uh, gives you or issues you a set of directives that are somehow magically going to keep you in control. Those are starting points. Don't get me wrong. I think dosing algorithms and so on are all right, but they're not an end all and be all. In fact, I have a hard time giving them out to patients now because I don't believe them or use them myself mm-hmm. other than just as a starting point. And I, ca- and I say that as a caveat to families. I said, listen, I'm gonna, I have to do this because you have to have your school orders for your child uh, that, a, that a nurse will have to administer. Um, I can't expect the nurse to be able to nuance things like you can as a mom or a dad or, even, or as, a, as a teenager, but I have to do this. It's part of what I have to do now. But it, it kind of pains me a little bit that I have to do this because I don't believe in it anymore like I did a number of years ago because of the dynamic nature of how diabetes uh, can be controlled. Now, you can get reasonable control, don't get me wrong, with, with, your, with your algorithms, your, your carb ratios, and your correction factors, and so on, but, uh, but you, re- can, you can take it to a whole other level. And I, get my, I keep my A1Cs down the 5% range now uh, by, by doing this in a dynamic fashion. You can get a good, respectable 6% to 7% A1C by doing it old school, if you want to call it that way. But if you want to take it to a higher level, and get down to the fives or even to the normals uh, below that, it takes a lot more, uh, you know, attention to detail and, uh, and, and, and sugar surfing. Well, let's, let's grab a couple of questions that I took from social media for you about that exact point. Um, this one is, a, these are mostly about kids, but I think they're, they're relevant overall. So this person says, if you want to employ just a couple of techniques with a child to increase in range time, what would they be? I don't, this is her, these are her words. I don't want to go insane and spend every moment thinking about and evaluating my child's diabetes. We want to live, but I'm willing to make some changes. 
Absolutely. That's a great question. Uh, the first thing that I find with any patient I see when they come to see me new and they've been taken care of somewhere else is that they, do the, they don't do as good a job in timing the insulin. And we touched on that, on, touched on that a little bit earlier. Um, many folks will come in and they may have been very well trained or they're very well motivated, but they're still dosing insulin after the fact. And if you see the impact of, impact of that on the rise of blood sugar that occurs after the meal, uh, you'll quickly say, well, we need to do something different. We need to take that insulin uh, ahead of schedule if we can. Now, depending on the child, if there's somebody you, you know will, will reliably consume the meal they have in front of them, then, then go for it. If it's somebody you're not sure that they'll eat the whole meal, uh, if they're on an insulin pump, there's some tricks you can play, like uh, extend the bolus over 30 minutes or 45 minutes such that once you know that they're not going to complete the meal, uh, you can still abort the rest of that dose and they can get about half of it that way. So there are all sorts of tricks you can play if you're using pumps. Now, if you're doing shots, uh, you have to just be certain that that child's going to be able to consume the uh, uh, the carbohydrates that are put in front of them. Um, and um, and I think that's an important that's an important tip in sugar surfing uh, uh, is timing. Timing is everything. The other is checking blood sugar two hours later, uh, whether it's with a sensor or with a meter, and correct anything that's out of range. And you want to use a golf metaphor for that. That's that's like having par three, par four hole. Again, uh, my feeling is nobody hits a hole in one with every every insulin meal combination. Uh, that two hour reading gives you an opportunity to do a corrected dose to steer that blood sugar back uh, towards your your you know your target number, uh, which in turn will lower that A1C because you'll spend less time up in the high range, which again will contribute to a higher A1C value. I, I like all the golf metaphors. You got to come to Charlotte and I'll, I'll take you out. We'll play some golf. Do you... <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the next question is, can I ask, uh, she says, can you ask Dr. Ponder about basal rates? And we didn't talk about this yet at all, but she goes on to say, I know he doesn't advise we use too many, but I find that my child, a teen, does better with about five basal rates, especially um, at least two overnight to account for the morning rise. Can you address that? Well, uh, basal rates uh, are, are have, a, have, a, have a purpose behind them, but sometimes they have, uh, some people use them uh, in a different way. Let me just try to explain this. In a, the way a basal rate should work is just to keep you steady at whatever level your blood sugar is after your mealtime insulins or your corrective insulins have gone away, have dissipated. In, in other words, it just keeps you steady. Um, However, some people use basal rates to offset indiscriminate eating and snacking that people don't bolus for. Um, and so as a result, in, in the Western world, we tend to run basal heavy as opposed to maybe in some other parts of the world. In, in, in Japan, for example, they run rather basal light. There's less between meal snacking that goes on in some cultures. And there was a study done a few years ago that looked at basal insulin needs in, uh, in Japanese children and found that they were about 30, 30 to 35% of their total daily insulin dose, which flies in the face of, uh, you know, the general rule of thumb, which is you take about half of your daily insulin insulin dose is a basal insulin. Uh, so I think that I think there's a general tendency for uh, people to look at blood sugar patterns and just try to ch adjust basal rates rather than just to steer them around in the moment. Um, there are there are increases that occur in blood sugars overnight, and I agree. Uh, growth hormone and cortisol, which is another hormone that you produce early in the morning upon awakening, can steer your blood sugars up. Um, and if you're trying to anticipate those in advance and 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 give additional insulin to suppress those. That has been something that's been done for many, many years. But generally speaking, most people uh, can do well with uh, either one, two, or three basal rates. And a good friend of mine who you may have interviewed, Steve Edelman, is notorious for saying that uh, anyone with more than three basal rates needs a new endocrinologist. And he can say that. He's an, he's, a, he's an adult endocrinologist with type 1 diabetes almost as long as I've had it and uh, very well known and respected in the yeah. community. And I, I certainly adhere to his recommendation. Now, if I, if I see a new patient that's on five or six basal rates, if, if I can tell them, uh, if you don't eat breakfast, uh, which is what you, you know you should be able to do, and your your blood sugar is in range. If your basal rate set correctly, you'll stay in range more times than not over the next several hours until the next meal. 
But if if all of a sudden you you start dropping or start going up, well, your basal rate may not be set right. Uh, you may be uh, thinking that it is, but it really isn't. But just think about the original intent of a basal rate is to keep you steady. It's not supposed to bring you down. It's not supposed to let you go up. It's just going, it's supposed to keep you at where you're at uh, as soon as the other insulins that that would move you up and down have gone away. And so if I wake up, if I'm if I'm trending through the night at 200. Uh, you know, between say I go to bed and I go up to 200 at midnight and I'm at 200 in the morning, my basal rate's okay. That's perfectly fine. It's just that I didn't correct that, that high, didn't bring it down. Uh, it wasn't that it was going from 200 to 300 to 400. That would have said it was not enough. Or if it was going from 200 to 100 to 50 uh, over six hours, that would be too much. But that it would just stay steady. That's the purpose of the basal rate. It's the purpose of the bolus insulin, so the, the, the individual injections of fast at the insulin, like Novolog, Hemolog, or Epidra, that you use to maneuver up and down. And, and another metaphor, a, a pilot told me that they perfectly understood this concept of sugar surfing. He said, you know, if he's cruising at 32,000 feet, you know, that's what he's, that's his cruising altitude. And if he wants to go down to 28,000 feet, he has to take action to make that happen or go up from 28,000 to 32,000 feet in his, in his jet airplane. And he said, I totally understand the concept of maneuvering at various levels and, and the basal rate is just maintaining altitude. That's all it is. Uh, so they Basal rates are sometimes misunderstood and they're they're overdone in, in some people. But I, I I've gotten to the point of just letting people stay on the rates they are, and if they can if they live up to the original intent of keeping you steady in the absence of food or exercise, then they're then that's fine. But wow. I find a lot of people don't find that's the case. They find that when they don't uh, add the foods and all the snacks in there, that the basal rate really isn't what they need. They need to be on something more simple. And I try to simplify that whenever I can. That's really interesting. And while we were talking there, I grabbed my phone because I take pictures. um, Anytime I change a pump setting, I take a picture of it because then I always have it with me, even if my my kid's pump is not with me. I have have six uh, programmed into my son's insulin pump. But the funny thing is that three of them, well, four of them really, are about the same as the one, you know, before. So I really, if I really wanted to, I could get it down to three tomorrow. That's funny. I never even thought, for some reason, I never even thought about that, but they're, they're separated by 0.025, one of them. They're very subtle. And, and, and remember, it takes about an, uh, an hour and a half to two hours before any, any rate change has a significant effect uh, on blood sugar. So what happens is if, if these are very close together, they, they may essentially just be blending into each other. And there's, there's wobble in a pump rate. The pump is not, uh, uh, you know, it, it's accurate up to a point, but even it has some variability built in. And if you factor in air bubbles and, and, and you know, the sites may be leaking, there's, there are all sorts of things that, that make our diabetes prone to having variants in it. And, and plus the meters themselves, the sensors aren't 100%, but they at least give you a trend. Uh, foods are digested differently every day. There's so many variables, uh, and it's in Chapter 5 of the book, you know, false idols. Uh, there's so many variables in our control that uh, you, you have you can do nothing but just steer within a range. And I think that's the bottom line. Whether my blood sugar is exactly uh, right now as I speak, 93, uh, or whether it's 95 or whether it's 90, is re- irrelevant to me. It's that I'm, I'm trending straight. I'm in a zone where it allows me to function normally, do my job, uh, have this conversation with you, uh, and not have a, a worry that I'm going to be dropping in the next 15 minutes or start spiking up, at which time I'd have to excuse myself and take a small dose of insulin to prevent that. Let me ask you another question, um, and, and this will be more of a personal one for me. I, I did get a question about teenage boys. This woman wants to know, what should a teenage boy's A1C be? And I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer that. I, I think there's a lot of variability there, too. That's so personal. But my question is about teenagers. My son is 11, and he was diagnosed before he turned two. So, of course, we went through many years when we did everything. He has a lot of independence. Um, he takes care of himself beautifully when he's on his own. But the last year, really, last six months, we've seen some of this teenage goofiness that I've heard from other people sneaking in in terms of, well, I forgot to check. I didn't bring my stuff. And, you know, with the hormone levels, we're seeing blood sugars that we haven't seen in quite some time. I'm curious what you tell parents in your practice. You know, what do you do when your super enthusiastic kid who's very responsible and does everything suddenly is this stinky teenager who's in a different mindset, frankly. It really it's, it does seem to happen to so many people. 
Oh, it's it's actually very normal. Uh, that's that's the normal process of adolescence. You know, they they are no longer your 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 smiling little kid. They're they're trying to establish their own identity, and one of the first things they do is to start to you know they're spending more time out of the house. They're spending time with peer groups. They they get into that phase where they want to be like everybody else, uh, and 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 you don't know what you're talking about, <clears throat> and it and it goes you go through that phase. Now some people go through that more than others. Uh, some don't seem to go through much at all, but you know, uh, the listeners here are going to, if not in their own families, no other families for, you know, the teenagers were just doing great as children, and then they just totally lost interest in any of their diabetes care or their diabetes management, no matter how much they knew. And intelligence is not really the the issue so much. It is uh, um, it's it is a lot of things that, that are very unique and very individual, as you said. And even within a family, you can have two or three responsible uh, adolescents, and then one that's just totally you know irresponsible even though they they grew up very well adjusted and, and they had, were very well supported that's just the normal process of, of, of growing up as a teen I'll, I'll say one other thing though and I, I want to make this point uh, clear you know a lot of people uh, can can get comfortable with the two-year-old that grows up to be 11 doing all these things and 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 the, the parents can then start to be backing off of it perhaps more than they should and, and I always use this this example and it, it's it's kind of silly example but it, I, I tell parents, uh, would you let your 11 or 12 year old kid with diabetes pay your bills for you or drive a car? <laughs> I mean, some of these 13 year olds are physically capable of reaching all the pedals and driving a car. They're, they have better reflexes than the rest of us. Would you trust them to do that? Well, most parents would say, well, of course not. And my comeback is, well, you'll trust them with a life threatening disease, but you won't let them pay your bills or you won't let them drive your car. And so it's kind of an interesting conundrum there. It's because you've been lulled into a sense of security that they've been doing this so long that because they can do the acts of doing this, the actions of doing this, that somehow they have the maturity to do it. And it's like me saying, you know, because I hammer a nail or saw a, a board, that I'm a carpenter. No, a carpenter is a set of skills and experience. It's not individual actions all strung together. In diabetes, because it's involving actions like taking a shot, checking a blood sugar, logging something, and even recognizing something's high or low, that's a little bit different than organizing things and, and, and working through a problem and solving a problem. Uh, you, most kids are concrete thinkers um, up to about age 16. Now, a lot of them can be shown how to do things, and then through practice and, and coaching, they can learn how to solve most problems. But if you throw a, a raw concept at a teenager uh, without any background, just the concept, most will struggle very, very hard to kind of put an answer together for that, all but just a small few. That's because kids are concrete thinkers, and about 25% of adults are concrete thinkers as well. That's been proven in the medical literature for years. Diabetes care, especially surfing, does require a lot of, of, of abstract thought. You know, uh, those lines that you see on your sensor plot represent something that you can't see, feel, or touch. You know, uh, it, it, you're, you're measuring the amount of sugar that's, that's present in the four liters, five liters of your blood and, and how it's coming and going. And they're, they're entry points and exit points. And that's a very abstract thought when you think about it. And you're trying to say, what are the forces that I can use to influence the rate of entry or exit of, of, of glucose into that closed space called the bloodstream? Even though knowing the body's full of sugar in other places, you're not measuring the sugar in the liver. You're not measuring the sugar in the, in the, in the muscles. And that's where some of your sugar pops up in your blood. It's when you stress, you, you're shoving sugar out of your liver and muscles into your blood. Likewise, it doesn't measure the, kind of, the amount of carbohydrates in your gut because they're still in your gut being absorbed and digested. You're just measuring what's in that bloodstream. And in a sense, that's what matters, obviously, because your brain needs to run on sugar, but you're, just man you're a flux manager. And, and sugar serving is all about managing flux and drift. And I, I say that in the workshops. It's in the book. Um, uh, that's what you're doing. Flux is a rapid upward or downward swing of blood sugars. Drift is something more gradual or slow. And how you learn to do that over time and as you develop more skills and confidence is what determines your abilities as a sugar surfer in the end. Dr. Ponder, let me devil's advocate for just a moment about the, the advice to parents. And I guess I'm going to ask you to play a little psychiatrist here. It hardly seems fair to parents that at the time when you say they're, they're not ready to drive a car, right, at 11 or 12 or 15 or, or operate heavy machinery, why would you let them handle their diabetes? It's not fair that that's at the age at which they seem the most resistant to input from parents. So as a parent, you know, how do you balance that kid who wants to 
you know, who's saying to their parent, leave me alone. I've got this. And, and I and I get dumber as my kids get older. Apparently, I know a lot less than I used to know, according to them. How, how do you do that as a parent? How do you say, I'm going to help you and I'm going to oversee this just when they're pushing back? I think the hardest part is uh, when, when somebody's managing a child from age two onward, um, the person who really owns that diabetes is, at that point is the parent. And, and when you're trying to make that transition and letting them manage that, uh, oftentimes the parent may, may take an, an emotional response like, well, gosh, they're messing up my diabetes that I've worked so hard to take care of all these years. And they're going to make mistakes. They're going to fall off the bicycle. You've got to put them back on. Um, the thing to do is, uh, and I'm not saying you, you, the parent does everything until they're 16. In fact, on the contrary, the parent needs to become uh, a sharer. They need to be sharing those responsibilities with the kid. In fact, they should be there with them, not to, not to lecture them, not to tell them what they're doing wrong, but just to be there to support them. And that's, that's a very difficult balancing act for some parents who have become accustomed to handling all the decision making, uh, judging everything that goes down, and, and in telling the, the child what to do. And, the child's obviously pushing back. That's the whole point of adolescence is to break away from the family, and diabetes is caught in the middle of that. So the the, the research, and this is this is work that's been done by Barbara Anderson and others, uh, good friends of mine, is that uh, uh, shared responsibility up until and around age 16 is the key. It doesn't mean doing things for them, but being there with them. You're still providing them the supplies. You may still be reminding them of things, but you need being there and letting them do it with your, you know, with your uh, guidance or maybe you're just your, your presence is, is all is necessary, especially, uh, for example, in your case, uh, your 11-year-old sounds very capable and very uh, potentially independent, but he would still benefit from having you there in the room when you're, when you're you know, checking blood sugars in or dosing or making dosing decisions and say, do you have any questions? and he doesn't, well, then, then fine. But you, at least you know it's been done yeah. and, and, it's, and it's a shared responsibility. He also knows you care at that point as, as well as opposed to saying, hey, this is your responsibility. You're going to live with this the rest of your life. I've heard that a million times from people wow. that uh, you know parents would want to drop that off in the, in the 10 or 11-year-old's lap and expect them to man up or woman up to, to do this. And all they're doing is, uh, is setting a kid up to fail long term. Yeah, they may do it for a few months or maybe a year or two, but at some point that adolescent phase kicks in and they start you know, taking, they start risk taking, doing some uh, some experiments and so on. And that's what adolescence is about. It's, it is about risk taking, and that risk taking could include skipping insulin doses, uh, eating more food, not checking blood sugars, all those things. Um, you know, and uh, and, and it can if the parents aren't there uh, at least to support them, uh, that's more likely to occur. That's that's what I've seen over the the 30 years I've been doing this. Thanks for for talking about that. I think that is a really really important piece of information to keep in mind. And, and you know, you are a, a pediatric endocrinologist. I know so many adults do so well with sugar surfing, but I want to pick your brain for one more question, if I could, uh, for the parents. And that is, it seems to me, uh, you know, I am, I am not a medical professional, but it just seems to me that there is more fear out there for parents than even when, when my son was diagnosed nine years ago. And I, I think some of that has to do with social media and how things kind of get spread and, and, uh, and rumors get started and, and different things get out there. But what do you tell your patients, parents about fear? And I guess I'm talking about, you know, overnight checking every hour or letting kids go on sleepovers or things like that, or even just the, the kind of fear that isn't specific in that way. Do you talk to your parents, the, your patients' parents about that? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, and I completely agree with you. Uh, the rise of social media allows one isolated story at any part of, point of the globe to go viral and then uh, uh, frighten everyone else on the planet, uh, you know, in regards to you know, the one that everybody worries about is uh, severe hypoglycemia, the so-called dead in bed syndrome thing. Um, and then uh, I see this all the time on social media. In fact, I've gotten out of several groups where that's out there because it just does nothing more than whips people up into a, into a frenzy that this is going to happen to their child. I've been taking care of kids for 35 years, and I've, I, I, I have had people that have uh, passed away from diabetes that are friends that were adults, and uh, some of them are from... Uh, Two or three of them, I hate to say this, were, were from suicide. Yeah. Uh, another was from uh, another was was from a, a severe hypoglycemic event. Uh, this individual uh, also had some other uh, hormone deficiencies that made them more prone uh, to have a problem. They were an adult as well. 
but uh, in general, it is exquisitely rare. Uh, in some cases, uh, and this is never discussed, you never see the details in any of the stories. Uh, sometimes uh, some of these can, these kids can have struggle with their control, may not have the proper education or training. Uh, some have, some haven't, but you never know, and, and you really can't question that when, when, when you get a story like that online. So you have to just take it at face value that such and such lost their life. And, it, it, and it, there's no way of, of escaping the fact that that's tragic. Completely, totally agree. Nobody should lose their life to this disease under any circumstances uh, in childhood or even young adulthood, in my opinion. But it does happen. Pe- uh, you know, people have bad outcomes, but it's not something that hangs over my head uh, every night. Uh, I-, I try not to hang it over anybody else's head uh, in my practice. And uh, but it it really does define people's uh, concerns. I I do know that uh, that same fear is oftentimes leveraged uh, as, as in a way to raise funds. Uh, for diabetes as well. Uh, that's something I've been long critical of, uh, and I've, I've said that to many parents in the privacy of the clinic room that, uh, that you know, being told that we're going to save you from the disease is going to kill your kid uh, really uh, upsets me quite a bit because my goal for anybody with diabetes is to live a normal life. You know, it has nothing to do with A1Cs. It, it, it's really being able to be the person you want to be, that God meant you to be, and, and, and that's what I aim for. And anything I can do to help you achieve that through coaching knowledge, uh, sugar serving, whatever. Uh, people have to make their own choices. But uh, I've not found fear to be a good motivator uh, in the long term uh, for, for, for achieving that goal. It's really trying to empower people, to teach people they can take charge of this if they want to, but it's their choice. And I'm totally a believer in choice. It's all riddled through the book. Um, it's all choice, choice, choice. Uh, I, I, I manage people who have chosen uh, to do only so much with their diabetes, as much as many people People listening to this would think that would be odd or crazy. It, it happens all the time. Uh, and there are other people who who, who spend their whole day uh, managing this. And I, to your question earlier about you know maintaining sanity, yes, you have to maintain a balance in your life. You know, watching your diabetes constantly throughout the day is not normal. Uh, you've got to have some balancing point out there, whether you're a parent or an adult with diabetes. But uh, but fear is my one of my greatest uh, uh, um, enemies. And and to, you know to quote the famous uh, you know uh, Roosevelt, you know you know, all we have to fear is fear itself, and that's very true. Uh, my parents were not fearful of hypoglycemia when I was a kid, but we didn't maintain the kind of control we're trying to maintain now either. And uh, so there was never a thought given about uh, passing away. The, the fear back then was complications. And, and privately, my parents and, and I even thought that I wouldn't live to see, you know, young adulthood. Uh, that was what they knew back in the 60s. So it was all based on information from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, which was not terribly good at that point. But uh, over the years, I've learned that that was all, you know, that was all just myth and misconception on my part. Because now, I'm, you know, I'm, now I've had it for 50 years, and and I hope to have it, you know, for for many more years to come. I have beat this disease, and anybody who's lived any length of time has beat this disease. In fact, I I use this, I say this to parents all the time. In the in the natural world order, I should have died 50 years ago. I, I should have, you know, without insulin. But thank God that we I live in the era that I live in. I live in the country that I live in, that I have access to the supplies I need. And, and I, that I have the intelligence and the access to the, to the resources not, that not everybody has, I realize, in this world to take charge of this. But the missing element is the, that, that desire to do so. And I've been fortunate to, to have that desire. And I try to, I try to promote that, that attitude with anybody I come into contact with, whether it's a patient or a friend or an acquaintance that has diabetes. But ultimately, we all have to make our own choices and we all have to live with the consequences of those choices. That's fantastic. I mean, well, what a statement as you're celebrating or marking, I'm not quite sure what the word is, but I'll say celebrating 50 years with type 1 what when when you look to the future here what excites you i know are you testing a, a new kind of insulin do you look at different kinds of equipment what what excites you about diabetes care in in the next 50 years my feeling is that the more we can educate, teach, and pro- provide uh, support to people with diabetes, the better off the world will be. I, I'm, I'm seeing a troubling trend of late uh, of more of an emphasis on technology and, and devices and, 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 and new drugs as opposed to investing more time in, in quality edu- self-management education. Because as I said before, you know, uh, it all comes down to the choices we make. I'm using a new insulin now that just happened to come out recently. Uh, it's insulin degli. 
it, act, it, it has a much smoother action curve for me as a, a type 1 adult. Uh, I, I, I don't have any uh, lows at night or even close to lows at night, uh, which is one of the known uh, consequences of that medication. Downside is it's a new drug, which means it's more extensive. Um, I'm excited about all the work that's going on with uh, you know encapsulation projects for islets, where, for artificial pancreases and so on. My only concern is cost of these things and uh, cost in terms of investment in time of the patient as well as money and who will pay for these things. And I, I foresee there being almost this, this multi-tiered level of, uh, of patients in the future of people that have and the have-nots uh, as, as our, our cure, quote-unquote, uh, uh, you know, becomes more and more costly. But, you know, I, I say this to parents all the time about the word cure. The word cure is Latin. It comes from the word uh, uh, curare which actually means to care, uh, to be concerned for, or or to attend to. And and, in that literal sense of the word cure, I've been curing diabetes for 50 years. And anybody who's still alive listening to this and has diabetes has cured diabetes since they were diagnosed. Uh, The the Romans uh, never really understood disease in the sense that we understand it today. So they just felt that if they just took care of you, just, you know, attended to your needs, that your body would, would heal itself. Uh, and in a way, uh, you know, the daily care I've been taking since March 1st, 1966, in terms of insulin dosages, uh, uh, checking my blood sugar or urine sugar back in those days in some fashion, and making some decisions, primitive as they were back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, more advanced as they are now in the, in the, in the, in the new millennium, um, is, is why I'm still here. And, and that plus the grace of God that I've not had an accident or had some other illness befall me, um, those are the things. That, and I'm very thankful of that. I'm just happy I wake up every morning. I, I really am grateful when I get up every day uh, knowing that I beat this disease for half a century. Uh, and there are people that never had diabetes that haven't lived that long, and I, that I've, I've lived longer than. So um, I'm nothing but grateful. I am nothing but grateful. And I don't waste my time being resentful, being mad at this disease. Um, uh, I'm totally at peace with it. Uh, I know people still struggle with it who are listening to this. Uh, I can't tell them they should be at peace. That's something that, that's a very personal thing to say. Uh, but I am. I'm at very much at peace with this. And if I pass tomorrow, I, I will have th- thought that my life was well lived uh, with or without diabetes. Well, Dr. Ponder, I can't thank you enough for joining me. I was looking forward to an interesting discussion about blood sugar maintenance techniques. And instead, I just feel like talking to you has been a light today. Thank you so much for sharing so much time with me and with my listeners. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you much for your time as well. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. I told you at the top of the show that Dr. Ponder has a free copy of Sugar Surfing for newly diagnosed families, for newly diagnosed people. And that information is at diabetes-connections.com or hopefully linked up in the show notes as you listen on different podcast apps. One of the funniest things for me going back and listening to these older episodes, this is five years ago now, is the terror in my questions about the teen years and Benny. (laughs) Benny is 11 years old when um, this interview happened. He is now 16. And I got to tell you, Middle school was the hardest. You heard me talking about there about his A1C inching up and his insulin needs going way up and his brain fog. And that was all middle school. Um, I can't say it's been completely smooth sailing since then, because when is diabetes ever smooth sailing? But um, it certainly wasn't the, quote, teen years as, as much as the tween years for us that were an issue. Of course, we're not out of the teen years yet, so I probably shouldn't say anything. I'll knock some wood and we'll knock on my head and all that good stuff. All right, coming up next week, I'm going to be talking to a family with a child diagnosed during the pandemic. Can you even imagine? It's hard enough to have your toddler, she was three years old, this little girl, diagnosed at all. But when you can't meet up with other families in person, you can't go to conferences, you're isolated at home. There's so many families that this happened to in the last year, and I'm grateful that they decided to share their story. So we will be talking about that next week. Thank you, as always, to my editor, John Buchanis from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here in just a couple of days. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.